Hello, hello. I am Vinay and I'm here to talk about learning Jetpack Compose by example. I am super, super excited to be here and to get the opportunity to use 40 minutes of your life on this talk. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Uh, to add some more context, I've been using Compose and dabbling with it since the past year. And there are very few changes that are as dramatic as Compose when it comes to the Android ecosystem. Uh, this has been a step change for me and in a lot of ways, a very positive change. So I'm super, super excited to share more about Compose. Uh, as the title of the talk suggests, uh, we are going to be seeing a lot of examples in code. So sit back and relax. Uh, there's not much text in this talk. It's mostly code because we are going to be learning by example. I'll be taking questions after the talk on Slack. So I would encourage you all to join this Slack group, which is session chat D2S2T1. Uh, I know it's quite a mouthful, but I would appreciate it if you could join that. I've also shared the slides in this uh, Slack room. So if you want to follow along, that's where you will find it. Um, let's get dive, like, let's uh, dive right in. So you've probably heard about Jetpack Compose at this point, and that's probably why you're in this talk. Over the last few years, Android has gone through significant changes in how we structure our apps, the language that we use for development, the tooling and libraries that help us speed our development workflows, and in general improvements in how we test our apps. What has not changed in all these years is the Android UI toolkit. This changes completely with Compose that aims to reimagine and simplify UI development on Android. Compose is a complete rewrite of the Android UI toolkit. A very important question that we should all ask is, hey, why do I even need Compose? Like there are enough options and I've been building apps for the last 12 years and you know, we get by. So why do we need this? Uh, this is especially relevant because we've seen some changes in Android. For example, four years ago, everyone wanted to use Rx Java. Every second conference talk was about Rx Java. If you mention Rx Java now, like you, you're either going to be frowned upon or people are going to be like, hey, I've already started migrating to core routines. So this feels like churn, right? Like you don't want to always do that. And it's important that we question every decision with a why. So let's look at why do we need Compose? The first reason is that the UI toolkit is tied to the Android operating system. And when I say UI toolkit, I mean the current Android UI toolkit. What this means is that if the Android team were to make improvements to the view.java file or view system in general, we have to wait for an Android API release to get these improvements. Because if you remember, we don't use a library for getting the view stuff. So all the improvements are tied to OS updates. On top of that, uh, like there are OEMs that can change some of this. And so there was this classic bug where one of the OEMs changed the Android color white to be off white. So every time you use white, you would see a different shade and you don't want issues like this to be happening. Uh, it's not a simple library that I can bump up to get these latest improvements. So unbundling the view system from OS would make it easier to quickly fix bugs and bring improvements in a backward compatible way. The second reason why we need Compose is that the current way we manage UI state has always been this complicated dance that we have to do to store as the view store their own state. And we need to make sure that the state that we store in our view and models and presenters are in sync. So that that's quite a lot, right? For example, if my business logic requires me to hide a view, that logic is stored in some view model or a presenter. And then as a reaction to that requirement, I need to get hold of that view. I need to explicitly hide that view by changing the set visibility method, which in turn changes the internal state of the view. Uh, now this is bound to be error prone because there are a lot of steps that I need to do in order to accomplish this. And majority of the bugs in our apps usually stem from state management. So there has to be a better way. We are used to doing a lot of context switching. So when we talk about the average workflow of an Android dev, we create views in XML, then create our screens, which have life cycles in them using Kotlin or Java. We then reference these views that we originally created in XML using IDs or tags, and then update its state. When we need to reference styles and dimensions, we again store them in XML. This con uh, constant context switching has some impact on our productivity, and we've come to accept this unfortunately. This is the cutting edge of Android as we speak. Uh, now, some folks might say that this is in fact good, right? Like we've decoupled the UI and our business logic. That's meant to be good. And decoupling is definitely good. Don't get me wrong there. And in this case, it's true that there is some decoupling, but you're still referencing these views in XML uh, in your Kotlin code. So even though you might think that XML code is decoupled, 
in reality it's almost just like an illusion and we all know this simple things require a lot of code i'm sure everyone on this call has already used recycle of views and you know how much boilerplate code we write to simply show something in a list uh, hopefully we we figure out a way to, to eliminate that and as you probably expect we are in compose so we'll look at how compose is handling these use cases so before i dive right into examples and this is basically the code portion of the talk uh, i want to add some disclaimers the first one is that all the examples that you see they are based on the alpha o3 release the reason i'm talking about this is because there is a lot of changes happening in compose and apis are changing all the time uh, so keep that in mind our goal is to not exactly by heart the apis that we are using but see how compose is approaching it and hopefully learn a few things along the way like i mentioned compose is still in alpha so apis can still change and be prepared for that as far as the beta release goes it's expected to come out in the next few months although there is no uh, timeline already rolled out about that all right with all this preface let's dive right into examples uh, whenever we are starting any coding example it's only fair that we start with a simple hello world example we just simply want to render some text on the screen and just dip our toes and get a feel for what compose looks like if you don't know anything about about compose that's great because the talk does not make any assumptions about your uh, levels of knowledge about compose if you already know a lot of about compose my goal is that there is at least one thing that you pick up from this talk and hopefully i'll be able to do justice to that goal so this is how we typically start most apps like we start an activity in this case i've created a hello world activity that extends app compat again pretty standard stuff there is nothing new in these three lines of code that we already don't know okay now we are already introducing the new stuff in the second line of code of this talk perfect uh so set content you might remember there there used to be a method called set content view and we would pass the layout file for this activity but this is not that method this is a set content method and we've never seen it the beauty of compose is that anything that you are using compose related you can just dive in and in fact look at how it's implemented potentially you can also change that implementation and create your own version of it and like that is what a lot of us has been do have been doing who who have been early with compose so i'm going to do exactly that i'm going to jump into this method and see how it's defined so i see a couple things the first thing is that it's an extension method it's extending the component activity now if you remember we use app compat activity so how can i use component activity here and how can i even call this method the reason we can call this is because component act, uh, so app compat activity extends fragment activity which in turn extends component activity due to this indirection we are able to use this method even when you are using app compat activity which is perfect because we didn't have to do any context switching or any new logic there the first method that set content takes is a recomposer and we see that it has a default uh, value associated with it in most cases we'll be using the default so let's not worry about what recomposer does for now the second method it takes is the content which is a composable function that returns unit that means it's not returning anything now composable is new and we have never seen composable annotation before what this does is this is basically the secret sauce of compose and it is the most fundamental building block of jetpack compose annotating a function with compose allows that function to define or describe ui there are some exceptions to this and you can always return values but let's not worry about that right now for now what we know is that when you add add composable to a function it allows you to define ui now to understand the significance of add composable it is important to know that compose uses a, a custom kotlin compiler to work what this compiler in fact does is that it changes the definition uh, of the functions that are passed with add composable at compile time this is critical for compose to function because the changes that the compiler does is what allows it to keep track of changes across all functions uh, we are going to dive more into this topic i know this might sound a little confusing but you'll you'll understand when we look at a few more examples okay so now we know that this method is going to do some magic and again we don't have to worry about that but we know that i need to pass a composable function to this okay let's go right back to where we came from which was our initial example 
and we started with the goal to render some text on screen. So text is what I'm using here. It's a predefined composable function that compose gives you. Uh, so I'm reusing that and it basically takes a text parameter where I can pass a string. So that's what I'm going to use. And I'm going to pass hello world. Like we started with, uh, since I'm trying to emulate running a device, let me add some cradle build time, like what we usually encounter and hopefully the app runs and it does. Uh, so we are able to see some text being rendered on the screen. Since we did not define anything about how to render that text, it just shows it in the default location, which is in the top left corner. So to make it clear, the composable you pass to the set content method is the root composable for that activity. In our case, it was the text composable method. The next thing to note is that you can call a composable function only from other composable functions with the exception of set content, which allows you to enter compose line. In that regards, it is very similar to core routines because, or rather the suspend functions where you're only allowed to call suspend functions from other suspend functions. So what we did here was directly pass an existing composable function. But what if I wanted to create my own composable function? Like I'm an ambitious kid. I want to create my own stuff, right? And that's what we'll do. So what we are doing here is that we're creating a very simple function. We're calling it custom text component. It can be anything and everything that you want it to be because this is just a name and we annotate it with the add composable annotation. This is me denoting Jetpack Compose that please treat this function with special love and care that it deserves because it's an add composable function. Uh, you can think of composable functions as Lego blocks that are in turn made up of other composable functions. In this example, I am reusing the same text composable that we saw in the previous slide. From a principles point of view, we would like to create uh, composable functions that are easily reusable across different parts of our app. However, this composable function is always going to display hello world. So let's make some changes to this. I am simply going to allow passing a parameter to it. In this case, I'm saying that I want to pass a parameter that takes in a string and I use that string and pass it to the text composable. In addition, I also created a new, uh, so text composable also comes with a style property uh, and it lets you define what the text should look like. So I'm going ahead and upgrading the font size and the font family, uh, pretty standard stuff. Like text style is actually a data class that is part of the text composable. Uh, so I'm going to run the app again and I see some differences like the font looks better. Uh, ideally it wouldn't have ended up in the center of the screen because I have not said anything about centering it. But just for this example, I call this function from something else that took care of this. So don't worry about why it's in the center. Uh, one last question you might have is that how is this text even showing up on screen? Like sure, there is some function that compose gives you, which is the text function and it ends up on the screen, but why is it rendered on the screen? So ultimately, every composable function is basically drawing things directly on the canvas. It's honestly much more complicated than just a simple canvas dot draw text. But just to simplify things, everything that you see being rendered on the screen is being drawn on the canvas. And that's basically how compose works. Compose in fact, even gives you a simple canvas composable that lets you draw directly on the canvas if you were to, but in most cases you won't need it. And you'll be able to use these primitive uh, functions that compose comes up with and create functions that in turn use those. Okay. This is all nice and dandy. Let's dive into some more detail. So one common complaint that most people have with UI is that my workaround times are longer. Like I can't preview things really easily. So what Android studio lets you do is preview these composable functions right from the IDE instead of needing to download the app to an emulator or a device. This is a fantastic feature as you can preview all your custom uh, custom components uh, from the comforts of your IDE. The main restriction is that uh, you can't pass any parameters. There is a way to pass parameters also, but I'm not going to dive into that uh, for the purpose of this talk. It's called preview parameters, uh, but you can probably read up on that later. So that's what I've added. In this case, I've created a custom composable function and I've annotated it with the preview annotation. So let's see what I, what this would look like in the IDE. So I'm going to click on the split uh, view and see that I'm able to preview it. Android studio takes this a step further. Not only can you preview these functions in the comforts of your IDE, you can also interact with it. 
Now, because we were only displaying text, it's not really interactable. So let's take a look at another example. This is a bottom nav bar. Don't worry about how this was implemented. But when you look at, uh, when you click on interactive mode, you can see that you can actually preview uh, the contents and play with it. This is mind boggling because you don't even need to load it on an emulator. Right from the IDE, you're able to interact with what you're creating and the turnaround times are really quick. Okay, this is nice. Hopefully y'all are starting to get excited the way I am. Uh, we're gonna look at another simple example. This is how would I display an image in Compose? Again, we are just trying to warm our feet to understand like how Compose is working and then we're gonna look at more examples. So I start off in the same way like I did before and add composable function, call it whatever you want. In this case, I'm calling a drawable image. Now I use a method called load image resource. This is also something that Compose gives me and I can use this to asynchronously load a drawable resource. Now, the important part to note is that because I said it's asynchronous, what load image resource does is it returns a deferred image object. It will be null until it's successfully loaded. Once it's loaded, it's going to be a non-null value. So that's what I'm checking. I'm making sure that it's non-null. And when it's non-null, I use the image composable function. Again, predefined in Compose. I did not create this. I got this for free. And I pass the image as an asset parameter. The next thing is probably the most important thing you're going to learn about Compose. You see that there is something called modifier. And what I'm doing is I'm calling modifier.preferred size. Now there are two or three very important things to notice. First, you can think of modifiers as implementation details of the decorator pattern that are used to modify the composable that it's applied to. It adds additional functionality to a composable and majority of the predefined composable functions accept a modifier parameter. In this example, we make use of a modifier called preferred size because I want my image to be of 200 DP. The second interesting thing in this example is the fact that I can call 200 dot DP and it's basically an extension function that returns a DP class. DP is a first class citizen in compose. It's a data class essentially, but it's used to define what we are typically used to defining dimensions. Uh, and there are similar SP and DP classes uh, that we are used to using in classic Android. Uh, the good thing about this is that you don't need to define your dimensions in XML anymore. You can do it in pure Kotlin because this makes it super easy to do so. And if you wanted to group these dimensions, you can always group them in an object or something. If you want to make things clear because Kotlin allows you to do all of that. So everything that you can do in Kotlin, you can do with these primitives and you don't have to do that context switch anymore. Now, the thing about modifiers is that modifiers are your best friends. And we're going to see multiple examples of why this is the case, but they are probably the best thing about Compose in my opinion. We're going to do what we did before, which is to make this uh, composable slightly more generic. So we're going to pass in the resource ID instead. Uh, and that makes it more uh, reusable. And when I run the app, I see that the image is loaded and like things are looking good for now. I want to quickly touch upon modifiers because that I, like I said, is going to be super important for us. So there are a couple things we should know about modifiers. The first is that you can chain modifiers. And what I mean by chaining is that I can add another modifier by simply calling on the previous modifier that you created. So in this case, I already had modifier dot padding and I was adding a padding of 16 DP. In addition to that, I also added a background color, which is a color red. And when I run the app, I see something interesting. So I see that the padding was applied first and then the background color is applied to this text. The reason I'm calling this out and hopefully some of you will already notice this is that modifiers are taking into account the order of how the modifiers are applied. So if I were to reward the order and apply the background first and then the padding, the result would differ. And when I run the app, I see that now the color was applied first and then the padding was applied. So it's important to know this because the order of modifier ha has an impact on the behavior. Okay. So we've, we've done with, we've completed two examples at this point. Uh, let's look at another example. Now the next example I'm showing you is the example of an alert dialogue. 
Now, this might sound strange to a few people. Like, what is special about an alert dialog? Like, why do I need to highlight this? Like, why is it worth a few minutes of my 40 minutes of my life that I'm giving to this talk? So this is a very special example. And the reason I say this is because this is probably the first time a lot of people have their aha moment when it comes to declarative UI. So when we look at the example, uh, or rather the definition of Compose, it says that Compose is a declarative and modern toolkit for building native Android UI. But what I didn't cover was what de being declarative even means. Uh, this just sounds like a buzzword, right? Like we need to understand what it even means. So whenever you're talking about declarative programming, it's important to compare it with imperative programming to provide a contrast. One common way that these approaches are compared with one another is using the what versus the how analogy. So let's look at what how means. Imperative programming is about specifying how I'm building a UI. How should I render a certain UI? And what are the exact steps needed to render it? So let's take the simple example of an alert dialog. This is what I typically do in classic Android. I first create a, an object for an alert dialog using the builder. When a certain condition is met, I use that object and call the show method on that. When the object is not met anymore, I can call the alert dialog dot dismiss method to dismiss it. Like this is pretty standard stuff we are used to seeing. Uh, let's look at the contrast of what declarative programming would do instead. So I start off in the same way, like I always have in the previous two examples, I use the same condition that I was using before. If the condition is met, I use the predefined LO dialog composable with the appropriate metadata. If you notice, I am not doing any mutations or calling any show or dismiss methods to update the internal state of UI. I simply specify what my UI should look like right now given all the conditions that the UI component needs to care about. The fact that this code path is executed when a certain condition is met ensures that this dialog is shown on the screen. If this condition is not met, the, the alert dialog will not be shown on the screen. Another non obvious way to think about this is that the program becomes context independent. This means that because your code is not con concerned with what the ultimate goal is, the same code can be used in different ways, which is almost like a superpower. This example also leads us into a very, very important uh, point, which is state, which is a very uh, critical part of Jetpack Compose. So I'm going to use the same composable that I created before, but I'm going to fill in some of the details that were hand wavy in the previous example. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a mutable variable called show popper. And then we are calling something called remember and something called mutable state of and passing false to it. Now we've never seen this before. We have no idea what this is. So let's try to understand what this might do. Reacting to state changes is the core behavior of compose. Anytime the value of this variable changes, all the composables that use this value. And when I say use, I mean either read or write are automatically redrawn and updated. It's almost like, the composable is subscribed to this value. Remember is a helper function. It's also a composable that calculates the value that was passed to it only during the first time this function is called. Anytime this value is redrawn, which we call recomposition in the Jetpack Compose world, it will retain this value because we don't want to recompute this value over and over again. It does it in a very efficient manner. And the only composables that use this value are recomposed and the rest remain as is. And when I say as is, it means that those functions won't be called again. We're going to dive a bit deeper into recomposition in a few minutes, but hold that thought for a minute. This is very inspired from other declarative frameworks like react or flutter. Okay. So I know a couple things. One is that. I'm using remember and it's going to retain values across recompositions so that it's more efficient. Mutable state is what makes it uh, observable so that anytime anyone is reading it, because we use mutable state, we, those values will be redrawn. The next thing I'm adding is using a button because I want to show this alert dialog only when this button is tapped. Again, this is a predefined composable given by Jetpack Compose to me. It takes in the on click Lambda. And what I do here is that I update the value of show pop up to true here. And 
the button also takes in another property. It takes in any composable. So this button could have been an image. It could have been a bigger, complicated component, or it could have just been a text. In this case, because I want a simple uh, composable, I'm just passing a text to it. Okay. Now, if you remember, we said that we are going to show this alert dialog only if a certain condition is met. That's what I'm doing here. That certain condition is that if show pop-up is true, I want this alert dialog to be shown on the screen. And that's as simple as it is. Uh, the properties here are not that important because they are pretty basic stuff. The only thing I'm saying is that when the on close request is called, which is when the on dismiss is clicked on, which means that when you're clicking on an area outside of the alert dialog, the on close request Lambda will be called at that point. I just want to update the value of show pop-up to false so that the alert dialog is not shown anymore. When this is false, we won't be running uh, the alert dialog anymore. This is, this example is basically where declarative UI Roly stands out. So let's actually run the example. And what you see here is that when I click on the button, the alert dialog is seen, uh, is seen, but there's something else that is interesting. You see when the alert dialog is highlighted on the screen, you can still see the button in the background. Now think about this. What if I want to hide it? A simple way to do that is I just need to change this condition basically change some basic Kotlin code to make it mutually exclusive. And what I mean by that is that when my show pop-up is false, I show the button. When it is true, I show the alert dialog. And when I run the app, uh, you will see that the button is not seen when the alert dialog is shown on the screen. This takes us to the ne next topic that we want to talk about, which is recomposition. Recomposition is basically uh, what I described earlier which is that in compose some functions are going to be called over and over again and doing so causes the function to be recomposed, but compose can do it in a very efficient manner. So let's look at the next slide and what this means in action. So let's imagine that these boxes are all composable functions brackets here, like round brackets here means that these are parameters to the function. Uh, square brackets here means that these are state objects within the function. So let's say that, the parameter to this function changed. What compose will do is that essentially rerun this function again. Let's look at another example. What if I change the state object and maybe I had a mutable state, like the remember mutable state combination that we saw before and the scale object changes. What compose again does is whoever is using it, it'll be redrawn and recomposed and the function is, and when I say recomposed, I mean that the function is called again. Now this is super powerful, but it is very easy to shoot yourself on the foot. And this brings us to a very important topic, which is uh, rules of recomposition. Now there are a few rules that we need to keep into mind. Uh, the first one being that, and we just noticed this, uh, some composable functions can be skipped. My bad. Okay. Ignore that. Some composable functions can be skipped. And what I mean by that is that uh, when you look at this example, you can't write logic that always depends on the execution of all these child composables, because it's possible that some of them are using state objects and they might be called again. This won't happen with all the functions. The next thing is that composable functions can be called frequently. And what I mean by that is that if I were to create a function like this, where I'm calling an expensive operation, if for example, this composable function was called from an animation, I would be calling this function at every frame. Now this is going to make my UI super inefficient. And so it's important to know that composable functions can be called at every frame. And so when you're writing that, keep that into, in mind before you uh, structure your code in a certain way. It is also recommended that we don't do a lot of side effects. And again, th th this recommendation is common with all declarative frameworks in order to do side effects. Compose has created another function called launch and composition that lets you create or call suspend functions in a way that they are not reinvoked when a recomposition happens. We are not going to dive too deep into this topic, but it's important to know and to know and be aware that we have this option available to us. The next thing to know is that composable functions can execute in any order. And what I mean by that is that compose will not give you any guarantees that child one composable will be called before child three composable. They can be called in any order as compose sees fit. 
So make sure that you're not making any assumption about the order. And the last thing to note is that Compose can optimize recomposition by running composable functions in parallel. Now this is super, super powerful because something like this is not possible before. This lets Compose take advantage of the multiple cores that are available on a device. And an example of this might be that Compose decides to deprioritize a composable function that is not currently rendered on the screen. Again, this is super powerful and something that was not possible before. We've spoken about how we want to run UI code on the background. The work is not complete yet, but they're already actively thinking about this. And so you should expect that we'll be able to do this sometime in the future and in a not so distant future. Okay, we're gonna start building some simple layouts and I'm running slightly behind time. So I'm gonna accelerate some of this. So we've hopefully seen uh, some of these example rows uh, or rather UI, like a simple image view with a title and a subtitle. We could have easily implemented this using linear layout or relative layout or even constraint layout. So how would we do this using Compose? So let's break this down into small components and then we'll start building it up. This is how Compose forces you to think about things anyway. So I see that there is some kind of a row which has two children. The second child is a column of sorts. And I spoke some English words. That is exactly what I'm going to use to create UI. So let's use the same English words. I create a composable function because again, I want to create a reusable UI component. And we already know we use composable functions for that. And I said a couple English words, row and column. Strangely enough, or not so strangely enough rather, Compose uses this, these exact primitives to create, allow, allow you to create layouts that resemble a row and a column. We're going to pass a couple modifiers because, Hey, I want my row to use the full width. So I use the full max width modifier. I add a padding and I do the same with the column as well. Pretty standard stuff. I wanted my first child of my row to be a drawable image. That's what I use. And I wanted two text components. We created the drawable image and the custom text components in the previous two examples. So hopefully you'll remember, and I'm reusing the same components that we've created during the duration of this talk to create the simple component. We know that we like to make things reusable. So I'm going to do what I did before, which is to make sure that I pass parameters in so that I can load images and the title and subtitle. I also made one more change, which was I updated the drawable image with a network image. Don't worry about how it's implemented. Let's assume that you have that available. I implemented this, but to keep things simple, I did not show the implementation. There are also libraries already that are doing it for you. So for the most part, you won't have to worry about this. When I run the app, I see that I am able to see what I was hoping to build a simple row component that has an image and a title subtitle. What is nice about compose is that the entire material design uh, configuration is already available for us. Uh, they've already created a lot of components that are a part of material design. So I can just reuse this and I wouldn't necessarily need to make some of these components that we saw before. Okay. Next, we are going to look at something that is super, super important, which is displaying a list. Now we've been doing it for the longest time and we have seen a couple iterations of displaying list in classic Android. So what we just created was something like this. And I want to use the same component that I've created and render it in a list format. And again, this is UI that we are very used to seeing, like nothing uh, non-standard or unconventional. What I'm going to do is create a function and pass in a list of person objects. This is my superhero list. Now we saw that we created a column in the previous example. Compose comes with something called scrollable column. What this does is that your column becomes scrollable. So if you remember using scroll view, this is what I'm using. So I use a scroll scrollable column and then I just merely iterate through this person list using a for loop. I'm basically using Kotlin to render a list in my UI. And I use the same component that we saw in the previous example. And this is basically all I needed to render something on the screen in a list format. Now we are all smart Android developers, right? And we know that we don't like using scroll view. And the main reason is that because it loads everything eagerly, and we know that it's good practice to load things lazily. And what we were used to using was a recycler view. Now you might ask that, okay, like there are all these APIs when I, and you've done your research and you're acting all cool during this talk. 
but how would i know and find what api to even use like that's usually the hardest part right finding apis to use so i identified or rather experienced this uh, gap as well and what i did was i created this tool which works like ifttt if for those who are familiar with it if you go to compose jetpack compose dot app you'll be able to find this tool it's on the landing page itself what it allows you to do is you need to specify the api that would that you would use in classic android and it gives you the corresponding api to use in jetpack compose it also gives you links to examples and the official docs so that you get to see how you actually use this hopefully some of you will find this uh, useful okay so now i know that i need to use lazy column for for using something that resembles a uh, recycle view that's what i use and because it also showed examples i know how to use it i know that i need to pass a list to it and that's what i do and it gives me an individual item back in the lambda here is where i just simply call the component that i created and use properties from the person object and parser and this is basically what i need to create a recycle view equivalent in jetpack compose now i want to pause here for a minute because this is mind boggling for me this is all the code that i needed to do for creating a recycle view equivalent this is huge because you're saving so much time now the way i was raised as a kid was that my parents always told me that whenever something nice happens please be grateful so i'm going to pause for 10 seconds even though i'm running slightly behind schedule and i need to say this prayer man i i really need to because this is mind boggling so thank you droid god for doing this with us uh, i rest in your core routines of promises of a world free of fragments guide me with compile time checks and help me in every suppress warning that i had moving on so we're going to take a look at some gestures and the most common gesture is a click gesture which is an on click listener uh so what i do is i use the same component that i created before and i wrap it inside a card component now card is as per the material design specification that we saw before i add a couple properties to it so we've seen modifiers before i use the same modifier and i also add a shape to it which makes sure that i have a rounded corner to this component because it makes it look nice now whenever i don't know something the first thing that i go to is my best friend which is modifier and what i typically do is i'll just start adding a modifier and because i want to find a click equivalent and again you could have also gone on the site to do that to find the equivalent api but if you don't want to do that i just start typing the word and more often than not i see the auto complete prompt something that seems usable and clickable in this case seems like it might help me and that's what i use and you also notice that i want to do something like call a method in the view model so i'm passing the view model and then calling that method in this clickable now this will work fine like i just basically created a click this no and this works totally fine but is there something we can do to make it slightly better and absolutely yeah we we should do it because this is not ideal the reason this is not ideal is because your composable now is aware of this view model so you can't easily reuse this component anymore what we can do instead is just pass a function or a lambda call it on click and just invoke this as part of clickable by doing this we are making our components more reusable and it's just better practice because then we don't need to worry about the implementation details and this is basically what i need uh, i'm going to skip this example because we are running short of time but it's very simple code what i was trying to show you here is that this is all the code that i needed to do in order to create a zoomable image view like this is basically everything i did to create something that looks like this i'm sure a lot of us remember using a library like an external third party library for making this scrollable panable image view 10 lines of code is what i did in compose to do that a very important aspect of compose is going to be interoperability and so we are going to look at a couple quick examples to do that the first example is how i would use compose in classic android now one approach to migrating to compose would be that going forward you start creating components in compose but you should still be able to use it in the old screens and so what compose gives you is something called as a compose view so the names are like like the apis are amazing because the names make it very obvious what i can do is use this in the xml like a compose view and in my activity i can reference this view like i'm typically used to using 
and just set content on that compose view what compose view allows me to do is enter compose land after you enter compose land you can like add any composable function to it like it can be a complete screen if you were to add that like this is a very easy way to replace a fragment for example if you were to replace a fragment with compose they don't enforce it obviously it's a choice that you have but they give you the superpower you can also flip this you can go in the other direction which is what if i want to use my old custom views that i might have created on android and use it in a composable function they allow you to do that also and in fact for complicated uh, custom views like map views and web view this is what the recommendation is now what i do is in this function that i just created i use a context now i can get hold of a context using a context ambient because i could not add all the content that compose gives you i'm not going to dive deep into context but think of it as some magic that lets me get hold of context there are multiple ambients available in this case i'm using the context ambient the next thing i do is i create a text view uh, object i'm wrapping it in a remember because now we are smart we know that composable functions can be called over and over again in order to get around that i'm wrapping it in a remember so that i only load this the first time this function is called because like creating views is obviously expensive and this is a classic android view this is the old text view that we are used to using what compose gives you is an android view in this case so when i wanted to use compose in the previous example it gave me compose view when i want to use classic android it gives me android view in the view block i merely pass this text view object and basically i'm able to render it on the screen like this is as simple as that this is super nice because it makes interoperability super easy now some of you might have questions that okay like all this is fine i've learned hopefully a few things but what what about all the architectural components and view models and all that i'm that i'm used to using like i still want to use that and that is totally reasonable like you don't want to rewrite your app right and so what compose allows you to do is use this view model delegate that you can use and it allows you to also pass in a factory in case your view model needs properties and this is all you need to do to get hold of a view model let's look at live data for using live data like i would access live data in the same way like i get hold of it using view model which is typically what how we structure our live data objects but i want to convert it into a format that is one observable and two it should automatically do that whole recomposition magic that i told you about in order to do that there are extension methods on almost all uh, flows and live data as an observable types and in this case i call the observer state uh, method what this does is converts it into a format that compose understands which is the mutable state that we saw in previous examples and there are multiple such x as state methods so collect a state remember a state uh, that you can use to convert it in a format that is compliant with compose okay let's look at the testing story of compose it's going to be critical right like we need to still want to test our apps so i'm going to use the same example or composable that we created in the start of the talk and i'm going to start writing a test case for it so the first thing that i do is i create a test rule and again compose gives me this method i create a compose uh, i use a create compose rule method and i disable transitions this in general is good practice because you want to make sure that there are no animation happening in your test it makes it less flaky and we do it even for espresso now i'm going to do some setup what i do here is that the composable test rule allows me to set content it basically means that you're doing setup for your test to say that this is the area that i want to test as part of simple row component test so i do that setup here i set up my simple row component and then i start writing my test so what compose test rule does is allows you to find a node in your tree and we saw that tree when we saw that uh, recomposition diagram what i'm saying here is that on a node with please give me that node with which has the text title what this will do is you'll be able to get hold of that node once i get hold of that node not only can i use it by doing that text there are a few more methods that you get so some examples are i can match it by using substring or i can match it using a tag now you might say that okay how do i assign a tag to something and probably some of you all have already guessed it there is only one friend that always comes to my rescue which is a modifier so i i would have added a modifier dot test tag directly to my component and then i could have used it in my test uh, methods 
Now, once I get hold of a node, I want to do things to it. And again, compose gives you a lot of things that you can use. In this case, I could have simply used the fact that I want to assert that this row is even displayed, but that's not all. You can also assert if it's hidden, you can assert that it might have a click action associated with it. Or you can even assert that the height is at least 100 DP. Like this, this, these APIs are super powerful because you can test it in a host of different ways. You can also perform actions on it. So I can perform a click or even perform a gesture where I can swipe down. Maybe if it was a list or something. In this case, we just want, wanted to assert that it was displayed and that's basically it. And you can see how easy it is to test and compose. And I'm, I'm a big fan. Okay. Last part of the talk, we are almost done. Um, and I want to share some resources with you all that I've been working on for the past year. Uh, so there are a lot of resources and I'm going to quickly go over them, go over them one by one. The first thing is a repo that I created. It's the same title as the talk, which is Learn Jetpack Compose by example. A lot of examples that you saw here are already a part of this. I, I've created a lot of examples and each example has comments. So the expectation is that you can just go through the comments and learn about Compose. Hopefully it, it is useful to a few of y'all. The second thing is again, what we saw in the presentation, which was at jet compo jetpack compose app where you can specify an API that you use in classic Android and it gives you the equivalent Jetpack Compose API. The next thing that I'm maintaining is an FAQ doc. So hopefully a lot of questions that come up during this talk potentially are covered as part of these FAQs because these were questions that kept coming up. Uh, the fourth thing that I've just started doing on Twitter is that there is so much content available about Compose that it can be overwhelming at times. And so what I'm trying to do is on Twitter itself, teach you about Compose or just share what I've learned. I've covered three editions and you can find it even on the website, but I'm sharing it mostly on Twitter. So if you go to my Twitter handle, you'll be able to see it. And the last thing and probably my proudest work is what I launched a, a month ago, which was a library for Jetpack Compose that automatically creates a browser app for you. So all the components, all the colors, all the typography that you've created in Jetpack Compose, this app is magically created for you by just using annotations. I did not want to dive too deep into this, but you'll be able to hopefully find it at this URL and hopefully find it useful. And that is it from me. Y'all have been an amazing audience. Thank you. I know I went over. I truly apologize for that. Uh, but I, I enjoyed talking to y'all. I'll be available in Slack. Please feel free to add questions. I'll also make sure that all the questions added to this chat, I answer it in the Slack. Uh, y'all probably want to go to the next talk. So I will see y'all later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vinay. That was a wonderful talk. We appreciate it. Um, like Nay mentioned, please go to his Slack channel if you have any questions and any um, resources here. Thank you again. Thank you. Let me just quickly copy paste.